All right. How's everybody doing today? Turn this off. Good. Glad to hear that. Give us a few minutes here, or seconds, or whatever else, and then we'll get started. So, if this is your first time tuning into one of these live streams, um, I do have experience uh, in hot and cold climates off grid. Um, so, <clears throat> I can speak with a little bit of authority here on both. Um, but uh, I think anybody could figure out what I like more. <laughs> uh, definitely the colder north. I'm not really much of a fan of the southern climate and the heat and everything else. Um, tropics, no thank you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, I guess we'll get started here talking about the, the difference between warm versus cold climate when it comes to living off grid which one is better which what are the pros and cons of each not necessarily which one is better but you know just some things to think about for somebody that might be thinking of, of going off grid should you do it up north should you do it down south all right so um we'll start off with a warm climate okay um <clears throat> and we're going to go over the good parts of, of living in a warm climate without electricity being off grid and whatever else there. Um, first and foremost, of course, you would have better growing seasons, um, which equals more food, obviously. Um, the Being down in Honduras and Costa Rica, and I've been, been in Florida and um, you know some of the other Southern states and things as well, um, you know, they have a lot of different uh, varieties of fruit and things and, and vegetables and that you know there's it's pretty incredible what all grows down there especially like you get into the you know central america and whatever else it's there's a lot of things that grow there um so that's one big advantage to a hot climate you have the better growing seasons a lot more food um little to no firewood needed for heat now you know being down there when I was in Central America, they, they did cut firewood for cooking. Um, I remember, I'll never forget this thing, there was this little boy in the village where we were staying and he went out and he's, you know, got this log and he put the log, kind of laid it on top of another one, you know, so it's going like this and gets up onto the thing with his bare feet and he's chopping with an ax, you know, barefoot, never caught anywhere even close to his foot, just totally knew what he was doing. Um, the coordination of that child was amazing. Cutting firewood, you know, just up there. I have to split it a little bit thinner, so I'll just put my bare feet, just kind of hold it with my bare feet and chop towards my feet and things. And <laughs> Incredible children in third world countries. But I guess he didn't have enough video games to play or something. I don't know. But a little sarcasm there. They did not have video games in that village. Um <clears throat> Another good advantage to a warmer climate is more solar power. If you're doing, you know, solar power and things down south would definitely be a better situation. Up north, the summer summertime sun kind of goes like this. The wintertime sun kind of goes like this, <laughs> just right across. Definitely. When I first set up our solar system on our property, I had it in front of uh, this one reefer trailer and I had it set up there. And the summertime sun was perfect. It hit it really good. Um, not a problem. Winter time came and the, the sun was down a lot lower and it barely even hit it. it would get the shadow from the trailer in front of the solar panel. So I had to move the solar panels. So down south wouldn't be as big of an issue. Um, another positive to a hotter climate would be less insulation in your house. You really don't need a whole lot. Now you would need some, of course, to you know, shield you from the really hot 
you know, heat and everything down south there. But um, you don't need quite the insulation that you would have up north here. Um, another thing would be your wardrobe. You don't need a whole lot of uh, really heavy clothes, you know, this type of stuff and whatever else. You don't really need a whole lot of that if you're living down south. Um, now, knowing people down south and everything else, I actually have bought uh, this thing here, an old shearling coat. Got it on eBay. Um, the old leather. You know, the, if you remember the uh, Marlboro Man, you know, ads in magazines years ago, that's kind of this old coat here. I cut the sleeves off of it because it was in pretty bad shape. You can see right there, I cut the sleeves off. But it's a really good thing. But it was somebody down south had it, and they said, it just doesn't get cold enough down here to wear it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but got it for pretty cheap. It was in, It's not in the best of shape, but whatever it works for doing work and whatever else around here so less less clothing for winter you don't need a whole lot of winter clothing and whatever if you're in a hotter climate off grid um another big thing would be no snow removal um again there's a saying here in northern maine that they say that uh, winter's not a season here it's a six month commitment <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah anybody that's from the area you know you know what i'm talking about um, we've all been through the thing of try a plow truck, try a, you know, yeah, you get used to shoveling snow and snow blowers and tractors with blowers on them and this type of attachment. And I mean, it's just one of the things that you deal with in a northern climate down south. Not really a problem. Uh, if you get a snow occasionally in a, in a warm climate, um, you know, it's going to be so little you won't have to do anything with it. It'll just be melted in a day or two. So that's a, it's another thing to think about. And, you know, you think, well, it's just a matter. No, it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, up here, you have to have a pretty good amount of, you know, equipment to remove your snow, especially if you're way back in the woods someplace. You have a long lane going back in. Um, it's a big job. I mean, you're going to be spending all day a lot of times cleaning out your lane. Um, so that's the good. And, of course, I don't I'm not a big fan of the South. so. There's probably some of you out there, if you're from the South, you might be able to add a few more good points to being down there as opposed to up here. But um, the bad um, would be uh, it's too hot for me, especially. But um, air conditioning, air conditioning off grid is a very tricky thing. They take a lot of it takes a lot of power to run an air conditioner. You could run one off of a generator um, if it gets really hot, certainly. But if it's I mean, it, People I've known, they'll talk about, you know, sometimes it'll get, you know, over 100 degrees, 120 degrees and things, depending on some of some of the southern states where you're at. That's pretty hot. And, you know, needing air conditioner, air conditioning with all of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an expense. It's it's something that if you run it, run it off of a generator. OK, um, but it's going to be difficult to be off grid down south and whatever else um poisonous snakes and spiders and you know maybe other insects as well depending on where you go you know get down to some jungle type of a thing you might have other poisonous things i mean I, down in costa rica they actually had poisonous little frogs and, and whatnot <laughs> it's kind of weird you know and scorpions and things every night you had to check your sleeping bag and make sure that there weren't any scorpions in underneath it and just not for me. Um, but uh, down south, I know, um, even in Pennsylvania, they had the rattlesnakes down there. And then you get down and copperheads. And I would go fishing down at the Susquehanna River. And you would always have to be careful jumping around on the rocks down there. And I uh, went to jump on the one rock. One time I stopped and right there's a big old copperhead laying right there. And just and they don't rattle. They don't really give you a warning. And um, you know, you get down south even further than that, you get all the water moccasins and all the other poisonous snakes of the south. And um, uh, my older sister lives down in West Virginia, and she actually was showing me the one time the downstairs, they had their laundry area down kind of in, in the basement of their one house that they had at the time. And she said she saw the spider, you know, this black spider up kind of, you know, in the 
you know, the floor joist of the upstairs there. She saw this black spider down there in the basement. She thought, I wonder what that thing is. Got a glass jar and put it on, you know, there and then took a piece of paper and got the thing inside it, looked at it. It was a black widow spider down there in her basement. So down in West Virginia. So um, we don't really have that up here. Uh, not really a problem. Um, another bad thing to being off grid down south would be, of course, the need for more refrigeration and freezing. It'd be a little bit harder to do that. Um, more solar needed to refrigerate your food if you choose to do it that way. Another big thing is termites. Um, I mean, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, it wasn't really bad. But I remember I replaced at my parents' house, the, the garage, they had a post going down in, you know, kind of concreted in. And um, and the one day I was outside and I saw all these bugs crawling on it, you know, and I thought, what in the world is that? And went over and, and it was the termites, you know, that they were out of the little white phase or whatever else, so some kind of a thing there. And it, they were just crawling all over this post. And, and so I had to redo their whole, the framing for the garage. And... Um, that was pretty bad, but you go down south even further, and oh man, termites just are a major problem. Um, again, when I, in my time in Central America, in Honduras, I remember there was the one shack out in the one village we were going and visiting with people and things, taking first aid to them and whatnot. And um, I remember this shack and the, and the wood frame for it, it was just little holes all through it and little dust piles everywhere and I mean the thing looked like it was about ready to fall down and there's people living in it um so a lot of bugs in uh, southern environments so that's it is something to think about if you're thinking of moving to some place north versus south you will be dealing with more termites here the only real problem we have would be like the carpenter ants if you put your wood down on uh, on the ground in contact with the wet ground and the wood gets wet Carpenter ants will get in there and they'll start to eat it and things, but I've never seen a termite the entire time of living here in northern Maine. Um, and of course, you know, another bad thing about a warmer climate is there's more people. Um, that's where a lot of the population centers are down there, um, which means it's a higher cost of living, um, a lot more expensive down there to live. Um, another issue would be more disease down there in terms of a lot of you know, bacteria and, and things like that, they have, it can breed much better down in a very warm climate. Um, you get down into Central and South America where I was different times and, and you get malaria down there and there's a lot of other things that can happen um, that would never survive up north uh, in the really, where it gets sub-zero, it would kill a lot of that stuff. So it's, it's another thing to think about. And then of course you have natural disasters, um, hurricanes, and of course, tornadoes down and you know up through the Midwest and, and everything. Um, I mean, we do get hit with some of that stuff up here, but it's it's usually if it comes off the coast down Washington County, down along the coast, down the southern part of Maine. By the time it gets up here, it's it's not really anything major. You know, a lot of rain and some wind, but that's basically it. Uh, it's really stable up north in terms of the you know, crazy weather and whatever else. So, and you get down into Central America. Um, when I was down there, um, I went through multiple earthquakes being there in the country and and um, actually walked up to a, uh, like a trail going up to a volcano, a semi-active volcano in Costa Rica called uh, uh, Poaz, I think it was. Um, so there's volcanoes, there's earthquakes, there's, you know, bad hurricanes can hit down there. Um, so that's all things to think about. You know, I've known people live in Florida and, you know, again, a lot of the hurricanes come up through there and just wipe stuff out. And, and uh, you know, if that's okay with you, well, then be a good place to, to be at. But uh, for me, I mean, I, we get our big snowstorms up here sometimes, but I'd take that over, uh, some of the stuff they get hit with in the tropics. So we've done that one. Now, what about the cold climate? Pros and cons of the cold climate. Um, the good, um, basically six months of free refrigeration slash freezing. 
um, depending. I mean, right now it's kind of a weird thing because the weather for tonight, let me just click on this thing. I'm not going to show it on screen, but the, it, right now it's 48 degrees outside. They're saying on the National Weather Service website, um, 48 degrees outside. It's going to drop down to five degrees tonight, and then tomorrow it'll be 18 degrees, and then that Thursday night it'll be uh, six below. So um, the temperature's really been odd this winter. And um, so, you know, where we have uh, our things at where we refrigerate it in our tiny home, um, sometimes it gets really cold in there and we just open the door up, let some of the wood stove heat go in there and that we can regulate the temperature. But the problem is when it's 48 degrees outside, it messes up the system. We can't really, you know, keep it down very low because wood stove heat still will get in a little bit into there and, and it can really mess things up for us. So, um, you know, it's, it's challenging, but, uh, usually if you have a, a normal winter, it'll just be nice and cold and you can, you know, have a, a cooler and put your frozen meat in it and stick it in a building. that's not insulated and it's fine. It'll stay frozen the whole time. Um, another thing that's nice about living in a cold climate, another pro to it is, um, heating and cooking together with wood. Uh, that's what we do. Um, while I'm warming up our tiny house, I'm also cooking at the same time. So it's, it's a really neat thing. And, um, you know, cooking on a wood stove or a wood cook stove, especially is, is a really neat thing. I think the food really heats more evenly and it tastes really good. Um, another good thing about a cold climate, no poisonous bugs or snakes that I know of. <laughs> I have never really seen anything like that up here. Um, so that's really a, a good thing. Another thing would be ice. Uh, you can cut ice for summer refrigeration. Um, not many people do, but I know that the Amish over in uh, Smyrna, sort of uh, north northeast of us here, um, I've seen them. They'll have their horse, you know, and they'll be drawing, you're pulling the wagon behind and, and whatever, and they have these big chunks of ice, and then they'll put that in their ice house and whatever, and then they can use that throughout the summer months. So you can get, you know, pretty thick pieces of ice, you know, from a lake and, and cut those out with a special saw or whatever else. So that's another thing that's good. If you move to a northern environment, you can cut ice um, for refrigeration. So um, another uh, really good thing about uh, a northern environment is that there's less, less people, which makes for cheaper land. And, um, and if you like, uh, huge crowds of people, well, then, you know, probably wouldn't enjoy it here very much, but, uh, we like there to be less people. Uh, we're not really, um, into big crowds. So another thing that's nice about a cold climate is the cool summer nights. Most nights you can open up the windows and it's nice and cool. It gets, you know, even if it gets up into the eighties or nineties, during the day, usually it'll cool down pretty good at night. If you have some good, you know, ventilation and things, it'll cool right down and, and you can sleep really good that way. Um, I've never liked really high heat when I sleep. Um, this year has been a little bit different because of our dog. And I've been trying to keep it above, you know, 50 degrees for him, for his sake, because he's just a little guy, not a real big dog. Um, but if it drops down into the 40s, we'll, you know, I'll go out and I'll get the stove going again. Um, but, uh, you know, um, just something to think about. If you have a dog, is the dog going to be able to live in the northern environment or the southern environment? Um, there are dogs that, you know, like a Siberian Husky or a Alaskan Malamut or um, Great Pyrenees, dogs like that, they can stay outside in the winter, even when it's sub-zero. And enjoy themselves um other dogs can't so that's another thing people might want to think about um another really good thing about a cold northern environment is logging in winter um, we've done that before the ground freezes and you don't get the mud and whatever else in the bark um, and if you go even into the snow then you can put things on a sled and they slide incredibly easy uh, you'd be amazed how how um, if you put a like a sled behind a snowmobile or 
something like that um, that can go through the snow. Um, you know, you need tracks on it. You can't just ride an ATV if there's deeper snow. Anyhow, you can ride it if it's a few inches. But pulling things in a sled um, requires very little effort and uh, pretty neat. And there's, of course, I've seen some guys that, that do logging with horses and they have like a sleigh behind them or a sledge, you can call it, or different names for it. And you can put logs on there and you can haul a lot of weight. Um, so logging in winter is a really big benefit. If you don't have that down south, if the ground doesn't freeze, then you're going to be dealing with all the mud and the bark and everything else, which is real nice, you know, for the sawmill and for your chainsaw if you have to buck the log at all or whatever, cut its length, in other words. Um, and of course, you know, like I said earlier, with the thing of warmer climates, uh, you're going to have a lot more bacteria that can breed and things and malaria and whatever else um, up north. That's not really the case. A lot less disease up here. Um, what about the bad things of a cold northern environment? Well, lots of firewood needed. Okay, um, you will need a pretty good amount of firewood. So it's kind of not really a bad thing if you like doing firewood. But if you're, you know, in poorer health or whatever else, well, you know, uh, it might be a little bit challenging to go out and saw and split firewood. Um, but, you know, if, if you get into the, the whole thing, you get used to it, it's actually something you'll look forward to. Uh, we love doing firewood, and um, it's a lot of fun. Um, another thing would be bugs. Okay, so I thought there weren't poisonous ones. Well, there aren't poisonous ones, but there are blood-sucking ones. Uh, quite a few of those. And um, black flies come first then followed by mosquitoes and then no seams sand gnats i think they're called and then you get into the the like the deer flies and the horse flies horse flies usually aren't real bad they're so big you know they, they're not too bad but the the black flies will typically go anywhere they can they'll hit you, they'll go in your eye they'll go up your nose they'll go in your mouth they'll in your ear they're just ah, irritating little you know creeps the mosquitoes of course most people are familiar with the mosquitoes they kind of everywhere but you know some areas mosquitoes will be you know worse than others uh, up here um, and then the little uh, no seams you know they'll they'll get you in different areas and things but the the deer flies will go after the back of your head for some odd reason they like to go back there um, so and they'll they'll just eat you alive some days you know I was uh, one of the first I shouldn't say one of the first years, but the one year I, I didn't get my firewood done in the winter time or even in the fall of that of the previous year. And so we were out in the spring and we had a bunch of stuff to do and it you know, kind of got later and it, and it got into the black fly season and I was out there cutting firewood and, and sometimes they would leave us alone when it was, you know, when I had my saw going because of the exhaust, I guess they didn't like that and um, of the chainsaw. But man, I'd have it shut off and I'd be loading firewood into a trailer or whatever else. And they were just all over me and biting and biting. And I mean, the, literally I had my shirt that I had on, it was stained with blood. The collar was all just stained with blood because these stinking black flies were so bad that year. It was, it was bad, <laughs> but uh, you can get a, a net thing that, you know, put over you and stuff too. So there's ways to fight it. There's, you know, different types of spray that you can put on. But that's something to think about. Um, I mean, I've seen people just about lose their minds over the whole how bad the bugs can get up here. So people need to consider that. Um, like I kind of said earlier, the thing of six months of snow removal. A lot of times it can go that long. It can really drag out. And, um, you know, I've had years where you think, okay, it's done. Finally, it's you get a nice warm day. It's 50 some degrees. And you're thinking, good, spring's here. You know, it's it's May now, spring's here, you know, or something, and, and you, you know, take your equipment, you take the plow off the truck, or you, you know, unhook this or unhook that, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's snow in the forecast, what, you, know, you get a couple inches of snow, oh, you know, I have to go out and do it again, um, but it's a big responsibility, it's a huge thing that you have to get into, the thing of, you know, removing of snow, um, another issue is vehicle maintenance, difficult vehicle maintenance. Um, again, working on vehicles is kind of a weird thing if you don't have a garage 
if you don't have a place in town. Um, I've had to work on vehicles, you know, in the winter time. You're laying there on the snow, in the snow, and whatever else in underneath, changing things and, and whatever. And it gets cold sometimes. You know, you have to um, warm your hands up and everything because you can't wear big gloves while you're working on vehicle stuff. And and I just literally um, had to clean the carburetor on our snowblower, one of our snowblowers that we have up at our property, and uh, the carburetor got some dirt in it or something i guess and it would run and then it would shut off and run and then shut off you know when it get it going and dirt goes up into the one main jet and then it clogs it if you don't know about that and so you have to take it apart clean it out and everything else so you know out there in the cold and and um you know you always bang your hand or something when it's really cold and <laughs> you know it hurts even worse um and then you know uh, working on another vehicle uh, two years ago, I guess, you know, and, and I had to take the carburetor off of this vehicle and uh, the mosquitoes were really bad that day. And, you know, you're trying to focus on the thing and, you know, and then, then you, you have your hands like this, and you're trying to pull your hand off, you're hitting yourself in the head like that. And they have black grease on you and things. I mean, that, I guess it would be the same down South too, depending on where you're at. But, um, up north, it's a very special kind of bug, <laughs> uh, infestation thing in, the, in certain times of the year. Um, if you're from Maine or if you're you know, Alaska or some of the other places like that, you know what I'm talking about. It's bugs on a whole different level. Um, salt on the roads, another major problem of being in the north. Uh, it is terrible. I mean, I've seen people with vehicles that can't be more than about six or seven years old and they're already you know rusting out in certain areas if you're driving them all the time and you don't try to get that salt washed off uh the salt up here just destroys vehicles and um i had an old truck years ago it's it's in one of the videos i i did um it was like 1979 ford f350 uh, super cab camper special it was a it was a neat old truck and i remember um uh i was at this one garage and this mechanic he was working on it uh, i had to have a little bit of work done for inspection and he said to me he said please do me a favor i said what's that he said do not drive this truck on the road in the winter please do not drive this truck and i said yeah i'm not really planning on it it was two-wheel drive so yeah i wasn't going to but you know he just said that the salt up here will destroy these old vintage trucks like this and and um yeah uh, bought a, a Jeep Wagoneer at one point in time from a guy down near Boston and, and um, oh, it doesn't have much rust or anything else. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, it, it's been up north here all of its life. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just barely any rust on it. And, okay. And, and he sent me pictures and everything else of it. And, and I thought, okay, it looks okay. And I get the thing and it's got all kinds of rust problems and open up the rear door and, and looked down and, and there's carpet was kind of looked like it was hanging down in something lifted up there's a big hole huge big hole look down and, okay um, rust on vehicles here in the northeast can be really bad and i mean i have two vehicles right now that basically run very very well but they're just so badly rusted they just fall apart so that's another thing you need to think about you know, you can have a vehicle down south, you know, a southern truck or whatever. I've seen those and, you know, they're 40 year old trucks that still run great. And it's just a thing of just keeping the mechanical thing going and whatever else. And they might get a little bit of rust on them, but not bad at all. But you move up north, you're going to be replacing a lot of vehicles. You're not going to have vehicles that will last you for 30 or 40 years if you drive them year round. Um, unless you have some kind of special secret figured out with cleaning them off really good underneath and undercoating and whatever else. Um, another problem with living up north here, um, short fruit and vegetable growing season. Um, and when I first moved to Maine back in 2000, well, first came to Maine in 2013, uh, I just thought it's going to be just some kind of, you know, nothing grows there and there'll be no, you know, anything, any kind of wild edibles or whatever else. <laughs> no, there's actually, a lot of farming up here. In fact, Maine, Aroostook County, the 
northernmost county in Maine was one of the biggest, well, I guess it was the biggest potato growing area in America for a while. Um, and so, yeah, we, there is a lot of ability to grow food up here, but not nearly as much as, you know, uh, down south. So like I said earlier, down south definitely has the much better growing season down there. Um, I read, did a study on this years ago, the thing about the Foxfire books, and they were talking about planting by the signs of the moon and whatever. And they said, you know, that um, you want to plant uh, your potatoes on a nice full moon night in March. <laughs> I just laughed. I said, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, not happening in Northern Maine. You're not planting any potatoes in March, you know, regardless of it's a, if it's a full moon or not. So that's, again, something to think about. If you are going to have, you know, um, you're really into gardening and whatever else, moving up north, it's not going to be as easy. Um, you can do greenhouses and whatever else, yeah, but it's still going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, again, expensive winter clothing. Um, to really get good clothes and, and whatever else that will keep you warm, they cost a little bit more money. And, of course, you know, bedding as well. Um, if you get wool, like a nice wool blanket for your uh, bed or whatever, you can find them used sometimes. I mean, I, we actually found a, a red and black um, wool blanket, a four point wool blanket. It wasn't a Hudson Bay, but it was, I think, uh, it was a Canadian brand. I forget what the Canadian brand of the wool blanket was, but it was, we found it at a used, you know, clothing store or whatever else. They had it kind of as a display. It's $4. Um, so it's like for a single bed. So four point, six point would be a queen size and then eight point would be a king size bed. But we like our wool blankets because they really regulate your body temperature the best. Um, big fans of those, but you can run into some serious money if you're buying them brand new. So that's another thing to think about. Down south, you wouldn't need that. Um, again, lots of insulation R value needed in your cabin, whatever you're in. Um, the more, the better. Um, more insulation is going to mean less firewood. It's going to hold the temperature better and whatever else. Um, we haven't been able to do much fermentation with different things because we can't keep our current tiny home. We can't really keep it at a real consistent temperature. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Like I said, if you're considering going off grid north or south, what should we do? Um, another thing is cabin fever. Uh, if you get snowed in and you're in there and whatever, and um, there's a lot of people that it gets, it can get real after a few days or however long you're really snowed in that you start to get really bored and just kind of thinking, you know, what, you know, I'd like to just get out and go someplace and whatever else that can become a really big thing. I know, especially in Alaska, I have my older brother lives up there and his wife and their children. And he said that it becomes a really big problem because of the sunlight issue. Um, you know, you get a couple hours of sunlight a day up there in the winter where they're at, and it can get really depressing. And, you know, so that's another thing to think about if you move to the north, uh, what to do if it's really dark. And um, I think it's a good thing to really, you know, stay active and stay busy. Then you don't really have time for cabin fever. <laughs> it's really our case. So. Kind of like to have you know some more time at our place there and you know but again think about it um another uh, of the cons the bad things about living in a northern environment if you're an off gridder would be it's kind of hard on your livestock you have to have a building for them you have to have some place where they can be out of the wind and out of the snow and whatever else um a lot of animals can take it they can they're up there. They can, you know, eat chickens and whatever else. And, you know, of course, uh, any kind of cattle or swine or whatever, they can take that, the cold, but you have to definitely make sure that they're provided for. You're going to be dealing with freezing water all the time. So you, you have to be changing the water for them to drink. Um, that's another issue. Um, so uh, another problem would be difficult travel slash increased cost to drive. Um, up here, you typically, typically because it's very remote and things, different areas, you're going to be driving a lot further distances to get to stores and, and whatever. Um, but it's, it can also be very difficult to travel 
if it's a lot of snow or you know you get some of these really weird um, winter storms where like um, last night it started out snowing and then it turned into rain and then it was kind of half freezing half whatever and, and so you get this really weird they plowed the roads this morning to get all the slush off i guess and but then it kind of freezes a little bit and they have salt on it and so it's like this really weird surface with potholes but they're not really potholes it's just the way that it's not potholes in the pavement it's just kind of potholes in the icy stuff that was left on the road um so you know travel can be very difficult um you know different times we're driving and we start going down a hill and and you realize okay it's really slippery and you try to gear down and whatever else and, and you're sliding and you start to you know you have to learn how to do that and um you know my wife told me the story the one time when she was in texas with the uh, military down there part of her training and she said it snowed you know an inch or two and she said cars are spinning off the road and whatever and she said driving by going you know, what is with these people they don't know how to drive in the snow so if you're from the south that's something to think about if you i'm going to move up north well you better learn how to drive on the roads then uh, it can be difficult another problem if you're burning wood is the issue of a chimney fire as i had described in my the firewood scam video um that's another thing you have to think about you have to learn how to burn wood correctly have, burn wood that's dry burn it at the proper temperature um it's something to think on uh if you have a masonry chimney with cracks in the masonry the you know you can have a creosote fire and the fire can get out through those cracks get into the rafters of your attic and you have a problem um i've seen plenty of places in the area here that have burned down as a result of chimney fire um i can't say that i see it all the time but i've seen you know quite a few since we've been here um which down south you wouldn't have that issue if you're not having to heat your home all the time with firewood. Um, another thing would be a, a grid down chaotic type of situation where the power goes out. Um, it's going to be a lot more difficult for people and things, and that's something to think about. You have down south, the power goes out, where you just walk outside and look around and huh, you know, talk to the neighbors, hey, your power out too, you know, whatever. Up here, it becomes a major problem. Um, because it's up to people or it's about survival. I'll say it that way uh, for people. If uh, neighbors and things have no power, um, they're probably not going to survive. And so what's your relationship like with your neighbors? Are there people in the area that are, are no good and they might come and try to steal things from you if the power goes down or the grid's down or whatever? Things that you have to think about. I mean, when we first moved here um, to this area, bought our land and everything, a lot of times I just left. I didn't even lock my, you know, our cabin up. And then later on our tiny home, I didn't lock it up at all. Just, oh yeah, I forgot to lock it. I'd be all right. Nobody's going to go back in there. And then it just started, I guess, with the economy really getting bad with the, the pandemic thing and whatever else, people can't go to work and, and whatever, they're getting desperate. Um, drug addicts or whatever in the area, or whoever's stealing catalytic converters. Now it's just, becoming a major problem and um, on that note I actually just saw a news report thing earlier on I was doing some research and and whatever and um, and I actually saw a guy was restoring or he, he fixes u-haul trucks and he actually got a call um, a parking area where they park these u-hauls and he said people are stealing gas from these u-haul trucks and he said the one of them was going in and if they they would put the siphon tube down in to get the gas out and if that doesn't work they said some of them he, he actually put little screens down inside so that you can't put a, a a siphon hose down in it blocks it from going down into the gas tank and he said so they'll go in underneath where the the hoses go in and um they'll cut the rubber hose like the vent line going into the gas tank and they'll siphon from there. And if that doesn't work, they actually are drilling holes in the gas tanks. Drill a hole down in the bottom part of the gas tank, and then they put their gas can underneath there and let it fill up the gas can, and they pull it out and just let the gas drain out on the ground, and uh, I got some free gas. And the people in this country, it's just incredible. But this somebody actually took a drill 
not thinking, you know, hey, the brush is inside the drill. They make sparks. And he said somebody was drilling the gas tank and it lit up and it burned this whole one U-Haul. He had to haul it away. So um, people are getting desperate. All right. Um, so be very careful about, you know, security type of stuff. I mean, no matter where you're at, you have to start thinking about that. Now I'm starting to think of, oh, great. You know, not only is there catalytic converter thieves, but now I guess if gas goes up to, you know, four or five dollars a gallon or something or even higher, I've heard some people say, um, you know, they might start coming around and drilling the holes in your gas tank to drain gas out. I, mean, I remember back years ago, back in the 1970s, they went through this whole thing of the fuel shortage and the crisis and everything. And my dad, he was an EMT for many years, and they actually got a call, the ambulance crew that he worked with, that some guy was trying to steal gas and he couldn't see. It was at night, you know, and he opened up the gas thing and whatever. If you get a vehicle from the late 1970s, too, by the way, they had locking gas caps because, you know, there was so much theft back then. Um, but anyhow, this this guy tries to steal gas, opens up the door, takes the gas cap out. And he couldn't quite see. So he lit a match. <laughs> My dad gets the call that, you know, this guy's been burned really bad and whatever else. So that was back when I was a boy in the 1970s. and uh, a very small boy I was born in 75 so um that could happen again we're heading into it just as a little bit of a side note thing here and we're talking about off-grid stuff but um don't leave your gas cans out around and, and watch where your vehicles are at as times get worse um another bad thing about a uh, cold climate this will be the final one is um higher infrastructure cost and that can oftentimes lead to a bad economy it's very expensive to run businesses up here um, the cost of everything of course you have a you know even something like a public school um, all of the heat that goes into heating one of those buildings up and everything you know it, it can be very pricey and and so that's another thing to think about um, the economy in northern maine is not very uh, great and that's why land is cheap here but if you need to get a job locally it's not always easy um, so that's going to be the end of this video here um, this little part here and uh, number nine is people who should not move off grid and um, I learned a long time ago uh, one of my spiritual mentors uh, Peter Ruckman and he said that he does his best to discourage young men from going into ministry just to prepare you for how bad it can really be. Sometimes um, you get this, you know, little nice vision of off grid living. It's quaint. It's, it's nice. It's beautiful. You go out, you can be your own boss and all this other stuff. Uh, I don't want to have people think that I don't want people from the South thinking, Oh man, we can just go up there and it's really cheap and whatever else. I mean, we helped a family out last year. They came here and they were, you know, moved all their stuff up and they were going in a week from Alabama. And, um, and I, when he came up, I was saying, are you sure about, you know, said, Oh yeah, yeah, we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll, we'll make it you're coming up at the wrong time of the year. You're making this mistake and that mistake and all these mistakes, but okay. I'll, you know, try to help you out, try to give you a chance here, but I have my doubts. Well, my doubts were correct. Um, there are people that should not try to move off grid and I will be talking about that and you get through all that. Um, so uh, you get through all the, the negative stuff and you say, I still want to move off grid. Well then, okay. I just want to be real with what you can expect when you go off grid. So um, we have a pretty good amount of time here. Questions and answers. If anybody wants to ask any questions, did I miss anything? Any pros or cons with warmer climate versus colder climate? I'd like to hear people's thoughts on that. Um, I'm by no means an expert on living down south. Um, so, no, my wife's not in the, she's not moderating the comments. She's overworking in her office. So,
question is merino wool good clothing for cold weather yes yes it is there's uh, the wool thing is really neat i mean there's a lot of different types of sheep and things out there different types of, of ones this is a cheap wool sweater here i got it at uh like a goodwill store in bradford pennsylvania actually and um i don't know what kind of wool it is it might even be merino wool but it's it's pretty good good work one but i have another one i was wearing it the other day one of my live streams it has stripes on it and that one i just recently got from uh west donegal ireland and um, it's made with some sort of a wool that they have over there or whatever else and it's it's not much thicker or whatever in terms of the knitting and the thread but it's so much warmer and so there's different types of wool but yeah merino wool is, is a good one um my wife's really big on that whole thing she has a whole book on different types of wool from different types of animals and things pretty incredible um Question, is it a sin to go to the gym to lift weights? There are people in my area who will literally uh, start on me if they see me. Um, well, uh, I, I, without getting into a whole big discussion, a big debate on that and whatever else, um, you know, if you're doing it to increase your, to be fleshly and whatever else, um, yeah, it's pride and, and things. Um, if you want to get in good shape, just work, manual labor. Off grid is a good thing to do there. Um, yeah. You can treat wool items with lanolin. Helps with how it deals with moisture. Commercial wool is stripped of its lanolin. Yeah, absolutely. You want to do that if you, especially with something like wool socks, because just the heat and the sweat and everything else of your, of your feet when you're hiking and the abrasion of it being in your boots. If it's not lanolized, yeah, they'll wear out pretty quickly. Um, so this isn't really about the off grid thing, but I'll answer it to off topic, but thoughts about Ray comfort. Um, not a big fan, um, changes the word of God and, uh, is not, a, uh, into the King James Bible believing movement. Um, and he definitely, he gets really confused about the thing of real versus false converts and he just for a false convert he, he makes it into the thing of you have to keep the law and you have to do all, you know, he gets into all this if you're still sinning then you're not really saved and it gets it gets really muddied um it's because he uses new versions the lord's not leading him to do that <clears throat> how cold and hot did it get in pennsylvania when uh, you all were there uh it rarely ever dropped below zero degrees in the winter um in the summer months it would get up to 100 degrees or so so, um, but winter time usually was December through about maybe the end of March, uh, April, it usually started to warm up. So, question, what do you think of polar baths in winter? Seems to be popular in Nordic countries. Yeah. Um, the thing of ice bath, ice bathing, again, if you, if you get into the water, like spring water or even like a lake, it will, it's not, you know, freezing or something in the terms of, you know, like 32 degrees or whatever. It would be in the 40 to 50 degree range if it's spring fed. And there are people that swear by it. It's a, it's a really big thing. And, and, um, you know, you go out and you break a hole in the ice. And, and I think it'd be good to combine it with a sauna so you're actually really warm when you go to it. <laughs> I don't know if I could just go do it, just, you know, strip down to swimming trunks or something and jump into a, a lake. But, um, you know, I think that there's definitely some good things, some good benefit to it. Um, you know, control your breathing and whatnot and things. Um, you can actually, you know, do pretty good with it. Um, so I'm not talking about yoga or something I can kind of thing, but <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm for that type of thing. I think it's good. Can you can can you get used to the cold if you uh, come from a hot climate? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we first moved to Maine. I wasn't really from a warm climate or anything, but uh, it was very interesting the first time I you know was around sub-zero temperatures. And, um, but you get used to it. 
it's really not that bad. It, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing because I know, um, back up with a question about the polar bath thing. I know some people really are into the, into the thing of, you kind of do that at the beginning of the winter to get your body acclimated to the cold. And it's kind of a, a winter, I don't want to say ritual, but it's, you know, something that you do to, to kind of get ready for it. And um, I find if I do that, not, I don't do polar ice bath thing, but if I'm outside and I'm, I'm working and whatever else, my body's really ready then for the rest of the winter. Um, if that makes sense. Um, question, did you have any other state you were interested in before deciding to move to Maine? Yeah, we were looking at different places and um, I was looking at uh, places down, you know, South Virginia, West Virginia, um, because I have family, like I said, in West Virginia. Um, we were considering different places and different thoughts, or even thinking maybe moving out west of Montana or Idaho, or it's really pretty out there. We, I liked it when I was out there. Um, and one of my viewers at the time, we were saying, we really don't know where to move. And some guy said, well, why don't you consider Northern Maine or you know, move to Maine? And I said, I thought, Maine? You know, what's in Maine? <laughs> and um, started looking at properties and things online and thought, well, I don't know. Uh, so let's just go up and take a trip up there to Maine and, you know, see what happens. And that's how we ended up here. And uh, it's a great place. Um, um, answer pros more vitamin D down here very true cons sometimes you have humidity issues having a tiny wood stove might help tips eating fruits that grow down here might cool you down yeah yeah um, eating local foods and things will actually help you to get used to the climate too I've found um, so yeah Yeah, <laughs> easier to be, get used to the cold than the bugs. <laughs> yeah, in many ways. Um, we like to do work outside in the winter. Boy, the bug season comes and it's just, okay, where can we go today to stay away from our property? <laughs> Come into town and it's not really bad. You know, if you live in town or something up north here, it's not bad with bugs usually, unless it's a really bad year. But, um, and then you can get out onto a lake and then the dragonflies and everything, they'll take care of the bugs for you by the time you get out there. So, um, question, do you think with prayer and fasting, they could stop the death shot mandates to travel or God could provide a way? I really want to move to a colder climate, but they're requiring the shot. Um, I don't know when they're going to stop the mandate thing. Um, there's a lot of different, um, uh thoughts on the whole thing of the, the trucker protests and all the other things i mean there's some problems with the trucker protest obviously it's going to lead to supply chain shortages um and you know anything against ma mainstream media attention and whatever else i don't trust mainstream media for anything and so i don't know false flag stuff controlled opposition you get into all that stuff but the point is it it represents the feeling of a lot of people that they're saying it Okay, let us just go back to living our lives. Just leave us alone. You know, so uh, will it ever get back to somewhat normal? I don't know. I don't know in terms of the, you know, forced shots and all the other stuff. Um, what kind of gloves are needed? Uh, is it okay to use leather? Um, leather is good for working, um, but uh, for any kind of, Keeping your hands warm, leather's not really the best, especially if it gets wet from dealing with snow and whatever else. I will show you the warmest gloves that I own. I've had these for a few years now. I'll put it on here. Um, right there. These are Russian goat hair gloves. They're really thick. Um, I don't know if you can see how thick those things are. They're, they're like a knit glove. Russian goat hair gloves, and um, these things are incredible. I mean, you can go out sub-zero temperatures, and 
and put these things on and, and your hands will be warm. Um, very rarely do my hands ever get cold while, while wearing these things. You can get them wet and your hand still stays warm. Um, incredible. The only problem with them is because they're so, they have all these little fibers sticking up, all this hair on here. If you touch any kind of metal and it's cold, <laughs> they come off. If they get wet, they start to come off. You wipe your face and you get all these little goat hairs on you. Um, so, uh, yeah, and the thing is, get them on um, eBay. There's a, there's sellers that sell these things, um, and they're not that bad. Pretty uh, cheap. I think less than twenty dollars for a pair of them, with shipping and everything from Russia. So, and then they they send them and they give you little pieces of candy that come from Russia. So, <laughs> pretty neat. But I've tried all kinds of things. Mittens are really good because with mittens you have your hand like this. And, um, you know, your fingers are together inside the mitten. So these fingers can kind of keep your, they keep each other warm better than if you have gloves or you have individual fingers. Um, so mittens are really good. Um, shearling type mittens that are um, like leather on the outside and then the sheep skin on the inside. Those are the best. Um, but I've, I've used all kinds of different gloves and, and whatever. Um, gloves and mittens are a big thing if you live in the north. Um, <clears throat> we get big old roaches here in the southern states. Uh, yeah, actually, my grandparents, um, my maternal grandparents, went down south on vacation, and they went in to their motel room. They got there late at night. And they put their bags down and they flipped the lights on, and the walls had roaches all over them. And, stuff, and they all started running, whatever. And my grandmother was really squeamish about you know, bugs or mice or whatever else. And she screamed and jumped up on a chair and she's, ah, you know, I'm not sleeping here tonight. So yeah, I know about the roaches down South thing. Kind of reminded me about that. Um, so <clears throat> question do you think red or blue states matter when it comes to living off grid well you know you can kind of play the game with either one with conservatives or liberals you know conservatives they just kind of eh, you do your own thing back there shoot your guns off whatever doesn't matter liberals you say well i'm just trying to you know decrease my carbon footprint so <laughs> doesn't really matter here in maine it's it's liberal down south and conservative up north so you know you can find areas usually if you go out into a country area you're pretty far away from a city um the people usually don't care they're they're usually more conservative um it's not the whole red and blue thing that democrat republican liberal conservative it's you know it's another one of the things that the media uses to split the american people up you know people actually start talking to neighbors and things and get to know people in your area and you find out you know they might be left leaning or whatever else but they're they're not the mentally ill people that you would the media tries to portray them to be or the conservatives being just total nuts either or whatever it's just it's a media distraction if i can say it that way uh so um trying to think of any other questions did i did i miss anything What kind of boots are needed? Uh, another big thing if you're living in the north. Um, I actually, uh, I've, I'm very much into minimalist footwear where I don't, you don't have a heel on the back and things because I messed up my lower back from logging years ago. And so I had a lot of trouble with that. And I knew a guy that was, uh, he was into, you know, massage therapy and chiropractic type of stuff. And and he said that when you have heels on the back of your feet, you do this, it kind of, the heel makes your foot go up. And so you lean forward, well, then you lean, you kind of correct and go back. And then you kind of do like the, you know, hunchback thing like this. And so it messes up your posture because you have heels on the back of your boots. And he said, you know, you want to try to get away from heels on your shoes. And so um, I like the thing of having what's called minimalist footwear where there's no heel on the back at all um i don't know if i can put my foot up here high enough but uh that's a this is a minimalist shoe like that 
There's not really any kind of heel, really good traction underneath. It's real wide, and they're actually, they have a lining in them. And uh, so they're really warm, um, really nice boots. And uh, that's what I wear. Another thing you can do that I've had good experience with is if you get like the rain type boots that have little metal buckles on them. Um, service at uh, S E R V U S. You get one that's a couple sizes bigger, and then you can actually wear like some really nice warm slippers in, you know, with your feet or, you know, wool socks and slippers and whatever else. Um, and then you put those rubber boots over top of that and you can fasten them and things. I, I do that sometimes when we go out and uh, go snowshoeing. We'll wear those rubber boots over top of slippers with wool socks. And again, the Russian thing, you know, of uh, different sellers on eBay that sell, um, you know, Russian wool socks. They have, they have some really interesting ones that they sell um, uh, with uh, some kind of rabbit fur that they make, they, you know, make it into socks and things. And those things are so warm. It's incredible. Um, it, you know, it's just a thing that you have to uh, experiment with. So, um, do you think it's toxic to rub dryer sheets all over yourself? I've never found anything that works against mosquitoes better. Um, I don't really know much about that. I've really tried it. I, I know that uh, I read a thing over at the Lumberman's Museum where they were saying that uh, a lot of the old loggers would actually use, um, what was it, uh, skin so soft or something like this? or uh, some kind of a or, or Johnson's baby oil or something like that. They would wear these old loggers and they that and then that kept the bugs off of them. But they said about you know that it was kind of funny. They all smelled you know like perfumed women or something. <laughs> they said the sweetest smelling loggers in the world, you know. But they did it to keep the bugs away. Whatever works, you know. Um, I mean, I've tried different essential oils and tried different things. You know, they'll just keep keeps the black flies off and whatever and, um doesn't always work every time question where do you get your shoe because i have wide feet um there's a number of companies that you can go with with uh i, mean, I have very wide feet too but um uh you can go with uh belenka b-e-l-e-n-k-a uh belenka that's the brand that i have on right now um, there's also uh, Lems, L-E-M-S, Lems Boulder Boots are pretty good. I've used those for, you know, worn those for many years. Um, really good. I've hiked in them and worked in them and all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's what I would recommend for that. Yeah, I think that might have been it. Avon skin so soft. I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think you're right. A couple of you have written about that. Um, so, um, how about jackets or coats? Um, the very uh, you can get wool coats. I've, I've shown that in some of my studies. I have uh, Filson wool coat which is they're really expensive i think those things are seven or eight hundred dollars brand new it's crazy filson is so overpriced not a whole other story that's what this this vest here that i have on underneath my this vest that i wear this is a filson vest um i got it used on ebay you can look on ebay you can find other things used but i bought my coat used as well um not anywhere close to the brand new price but wool coats i recommend uh, very much um shearling where you have the the leather on the outside and then the sheep skin on the inside these are about the warmest that you can get um the problem with this is that it keeps the heat in so if you're doing a lot of work um it'll keep the sweat in it doesn't really breathe um a wool sweater like i'm wearing right here with different layers in it, um, you can work and the, it will not, you won't get just hot and sweaty inside the thing. Um, then you can get into some of the, you know, if you get into the polyester fleece type of things, I just, 
I don't really care for that stuff. Um, you know, it's, uh, it just makes me sweat and I, I don't really care for it much. I'm, I'm really big on natural fibers and we all are. So we have quite a lot of experience with that. Now, you know, for children, put them in a snowsuit. And they, my son, he wears a snowsuit all the time in the winter over his other clothes. And, you know, it's best because he's out playing in the snow and he's rolling around in the snow and everything. You know, you know, don't really want to do that with uh, leather. Um, not really the best for it. Uh, but if you look up, you know, the shearling type coats, um, you can spend like a full length shearling that's made like this. This, like I said, is just my vest. Um, a full length one like that can cost you know, anywhere from two to three thousand dollars for one of those things. So you want to try to find one used. They're very expensive. Um, I've seen ones in Germany, um, Christ brand actually. And some of those things will run, you know, $5,000. So yeah. Okay, off topic, but when it comes to making decisions, preachers say if you don't have the peace of God, don't do it. How do you know if the de decision you're making is coming from the Lord? The Lord will open doors and the Lord will close doors. You just have to wait on the Lord. You have to pray about it. Um, and, you know, you, it's just something that you have to go through and you have to wait and just say, okay, Lord, I need to know one way or the other on this. Um, so. Uh, okay, I think I missed one here. Um, question, what brand are your shoes? The, the ones I'm wearing are Bilenka. Let's see if I can put my foot up here again. <laughs> Try not to step on my dog down there. Um, I can't, can't really see. It just says BE47 is the size. But they're uh, Bilenka brand. Um, they're good. There's a, there's a number of um, minimalist footwear type of of shoes out there so i was thinking it said b-link underneath but it doesn't so well i guess that's going to be it for today a little over an hour again here so that's like i said i'm trying to keep it to about an hour uh, again if you can like the video um, to help it kind of get rated or whatever else leave a comment that'd be great and um and I guess that'll be it. Um, so, okay, we will see everybody tomorrow. We're going to be talking about what did I say it was here? People who should not move off grid. Um, yeah, it's going to be an important one. So that will be it. Thank you for watching.